Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist and the author of the Complete Compliance Handbook. And I'd like to welcome you to This Week in FCPA, Episode 106, for the week ending June 8th, 2018, the Back in the FCPA Saddle Again. First, a word about our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 700 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help improve your company's ethics and compliance program, visit Affiliated Monitors at their website, www.affiliatedmonitors.com. With a wild ride of FCPA cases over the past week, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors, and myself are back in the FCPA saddle to take a look at some of the top compliance stories from the past week. We, of course, start with Societe Generale and Leg Mason FCPA enforcement actions. We also talk about the Credit Suisse FCPA enforcement action. We consider potential FCPA enforcement action involving Deutsche Bank for uh, its sons and daughters, alleged sons and daughters hiring program. We also have the news of the ZTE settlement with the Department of Commerce. We consider the new director of the UK Serious Fraud Office is a American. Uh, We talk about Mike Volkoff's question about what happens when corporate leaders fail to listen and are the compliance practitioners, compliance officers, and compliance function in for a reckoning. We talk about my upcoming Compliance Masterclass, which will be held in Houston, July 21 and 22. We note I will have a book signing of my new book, The Complete Compliance Handbook, at River Oaks Bookstore on June 28th from 5.30 to 7. And we discuss a five, the five-part podcast series I had this week on suspension and the barment with Rod Grandin, Managing Director at Affiliated Monitors, the sponsor of the podcast Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, back again with Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors, for another episode of This Week in FCPA. This is episode 106 for the week ending June 8th, 2018, the back in the FCPA saddle again. Uh, Jay, we had one of the uh, uh, most significant weeks in uh, the FCPA that we've uh, had in quite some time, certainly in 2018. So why don't we tell the folks why we're back in the FCPA saddle again? Well, we have a, a certain amount of settlements this week. We we got some variety here for you. If you want a DPA, we got a DPA. We got a little NPA. We got um, questionable deals happening all over the world. But first thing, um, let's talk about a couple uh, banking uh, clients who both had some problems in Libya. So. Why don't you tell us about uh, Society General and uh, Leg Mason? So, uh, thank you. We've got um, an, really an interrelated FCPA enforcement action involving two companies, two separate enforcement actions. I would note we have the <clears throat> NPA that was issued to Leg Mason and Investment Bank. We do not have, uh, as of the recording of this podcast, the full DPA, criminal information, and other settlement documents for Society General. So we can't can't really take a, a too deep a dive into that as yet, other than what's in the press release. But uh, we should note that Society General uh, paid $585 million fine, uh, of which half goes to the um, French Parquet National Financier, PNF, for its investigations, uh, investigative work and enforcement action in this matter. It's the fifth highest FCPA fine ever. And uh, it was all around the the company's uh, payment of bribes to get business, uh, frankly, a ton of business from uh, various state-owned enterprises in Libya after Libya was open to the West. So uh, this is the second uh, series of cases we had Oxif. Well, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe 18 months ago, uh, <clears throat> where the company paid bribes to get uh, business from the Qaddafi regime and now Societe Generale and Leg Mason. Leg Mason paid $71 million for being 
Societe Generale's partner and fellow schemer, but <clears throat> it was clear from at least the Lake Mason non-prosecution agreement that uh, they were not the leader, they were the follower, a facilitator for sure. So um, we're going to be able to get in, probably get into this one in a deeper dive uh, in a later podcast since we don't have the facts. But in the Lake Mason MPA, there were some pretty egregious facts. It was clear that this was an intentional effort. It was clear that uh, uh, the uh, subsidiary of Lake Mason, Vermal, was uh, well aware of what it was doing. Uh, they actively sought to hide the um, uh, bribes. They actively sought to obstructicate their books and records. Uh, around the uh, payments to the corrupt Libyan third parties who funneled the money to the corrupt government officials. So uh, just a huge case uh, with Societe Generale. Once again, number five on the uh, top 10 FCPA list, uh, Lake Mason significantly less, but also demonstrating once again that um, uh, when you go to a high-risk area, management of companies needs to be aware, and they need to understand that if uh, you're going to go do business in a high-risk area, in which Libya has always been viewed that way, that you need to manage that risk more closely. So a uh, pretty interesting uh, couple of cases there. Uh, we cite to lots of reports. Jacqueline Jagger did a great um, report in Compliance Week. If you've got a subscription to Compliance Week, Henry Cutter talked about it in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, that was Society General. And then uh, Dick Casson, of course, uh, broke the story for the compliance community, both for Lake Mason and Society General. And I wrote uh, about uh, both cases this week. We've linked to that. And uh, we've also linked to the uh, Lake Mason MPA. So lots of uh, materials there, lots to discuss. Uh, I thought some uh, pretty good lessons learned in Lake Mason that I wrote about. And I think there's going to be a lot more in Society General when we get those documents. So kind of looking forward to exploring that uh, next week, Jay. Yeah, the, the other thing that we left out, there's actually two L's at play here. So one is for Libya. And the other one is for LIBOR, and Sock Gen was uh, wrapped up in that. And I think uh, all in, the total amount of fines and disgorgement, both for the LIBOR matter and for the Libya matter, matter is going to top a billion dollars. So uh, another bank behaving badly. Um, uh, let me just pick up on that, Jay, because um, uh, it was reported today in the uh, Financial Times that the top banker at – Society General actually was a part of the LIBOR manipulation. So we had the former head of corporate investment banking um, and his uh, deputy both resigned from the bank earlier this year. And now it turns out that it's because they were actually involved in the LIBOR scam. Now, there's apparently no current criminal investigation open on these uh, two gentlemen. It may be because there's no extradition treaty with France. It may be for other reasons. But at least on the LIBOR side of things at Society General, um, we had C-suite involvement uh, in the LIBOR scam, in the LIBOR fraud, and uh, neither company self-disclosed, so they lost uh, any ability to get that credit. Um, but uh, at least with Leg Mason, um, they received a 25% discount off the minimum uh, of the sentencing guideline range because of their uh, ex uh, cooperation after uh, the investigation got going. So uh, if there's one lesson from uh, Leg Mason, Jay, it would be that as bad as uh, your conduct is, where you have uh, actual intentional bribery and corruption, um, that you can make, uh, can receive a discount. And once again, this came in under the new FCPA corporate enforcement policy announced in November 2017 and shows that the Department of Justice will reward, me, reward companies who engage in the desired activity meaningful credit, 25% off the minimum uh, on the sentencing range. So, uh, you know, at least kudos to Leg Mason for getting that. But the Society General, we don't know where that. Uh, what level of involvement there was at management level, if any, in the bribery case, but certainly on the LIBOR case, it went up directly to the C-suite. So, uh, but a huge fine. So, uh, great, uh, great catch on the the double L's. But we had yet another um, FCPA case that uh, perhaps you could tell us about. Sure. So here's another NPA, and this is with uh, Credit Suisse, and they are agreeing to pay a $47 million penalty to the DOJ 
uh, to end an FCPA investigation into hiring practices in Asia between 2007 and 2013. And if this um, sounds familiar, you'll recall back in 2015, uh, BNY Mellon paid 14.8 million to the SEC to dissolve, uh, resolve FCPA offenses for providing internships to family members uh, connected to a Middle Eastern sovereign wealth fund. And then in 2016, JP Morgan Chase had their own princeling case. So this is a uh, uh, another, I wouldn't necessarily call it a sweep, but this again falls into uh, banks trying to curry favor and uh, either hiring uh, relatives or family members and then seeing a direct re result of this hiring by uh, having more business coming their way. And I have a feeling we might have another one of these stories in a couple minutes. Uh, anything else you wanted to add on Credit Suisse, Tom? No, but why don't you just let me take that uh, that other story up now, because um, we had a report uh, I thought was very interesting that a civil lawsuit revealed that Deutsche Bank is under FCPA scrutiny for its um, sons and daughters hiring program with Russian ministers. And this is uh, the first time we've uh, heard of a, a potential investigation or an investigation involving sons and daughters of government officials of banking entities outside of China. So Deutsche Bank had its own project uh, named Project Dustan, a Persian word for the kind of ornate oral histories that are common across Central Asia for um, a uh, sons and daughters hiring program. And this uh, came about because of, like I said, a civil suit that was filed in Germany um, that uh, talked about it. So, uh, we don't really know the parameters of this, but uh, it was interesting that this news came out, uh, like you said, Jay, literally on the hill, hill, heels of uh, Credit Suisse uh, settling their princeling lawsuit. But, Jay, we had another um, type of compliance violation tied more to um, trade sanctions and economic sanctions. Uh, that came out this week that that really was stunning. So um, why don't you let me let me uh, just at least introduce the topic of ZTE because I think the compliance community is going to be parsing this for quite some time. For those who uh, may not remember, in March ZTE agreed to a fine and penalty of uh, some eight hundred and ninety two million dollars for uh, violation of economic sanctions in selling. Uh, materials to North Korea and I think Iran. The um, company agreed to a deferred prosecution agreement, pled guilty, and is in uh, a federal district court in Dallas. Separate and apart from this, uh, the Department of Commerce in April announced that it was slapping a seven-year ban on G uh, ZTE from doing business with any American company for its failure to live up to the terms and conditions of the deferred prosecution agreement. This was called denial of export privileges, which meant that it could not export from the U.S. the necessary hardware to build its um, smartphones. And this literally was devastating <clears throat> to the company. And indeed, the company uh, almost had to sh shut down or did shut down production, uh, 80,000 employees in China. Uh, the Chinese government appealed to Donald Trump directly to overturn this, and he directed um, in the strongest possible terms in a tweet that a Commerce Department to uh, change this sanctions ruling. And so this week, the uh, Department of Commerce announced a resolution with ZTE, which included an additional $1 billion in penalties, a $400 million escrow, and indeed a U.S.-appointed compliance department, not monitor, but a complete compliance department that will be embedded in ZTE in China that will report to the Department of Commerce. So uh, this um, monitor will function on a real-time basis to determine G ZTE's compliance with U.S. export and economic sanctions laws. So this is a, a really a stunning uh, uh, resolution of this case. Uh, we've got uh, several reports of it from Dick Casson, from Sam Rubenfeld, and one uh, reporter, Alex Lawson, um, writing in uh, 
Law 360 uh, raised some at least troubling questions um, that the uh, ZTE matter really appears to be uh, simply a presidential pardon uh, based upon, uh, if not a payment to uh, the Trump interest, certainly uh, uh, some economic benefits granted by the Chinese government. His daughter received a uh, trademark or trade name registration. Uh, there was a funding of a loan to uh, one of the Trump entities, uh, perhaps. And then uh, there was also some uh, uh, resolution of U.S. economic interest. So, um, And we have the anomaly of a president ordering a commerce department to uh, change its economic sanction. But lots to parse, lots to go into. I think from the compliance perspective, Jay, we're going to be slicing and dicing this one for uh, quite some time. Now, is there any um, mechanism for Congress to roll this back? So uh, I am not aware of any mechanism to roll it back. Uh, Congress could change the laws to uh, require certainly um, some sort of uh, notification. I'm not sure under the Administrative Law Act if Congress can intercede directly in an administrative ruling or, or not directly as in have the right to over overturn it. But you're absolutely right to bring up Congress. Several members of Congress have uh, expressed dismay over this. They view ZTE as a national security matter as opposed to uh, some other type of uh, export control or economic sanction matter. So um, the other thing I would just raise is uh, there's another uh, constituency here, and that is companies like Qualcomm that were suppliers to ZTE, and they lost all of that business. And then the distributors of ZTE smartphones uh, in the United States uh, also lost uh, all of their supply chain. So there was really lots of moving parts going here. So I'm going to credit somebody for at least cutting through the moving parts to get it get it all resolved. But uh, lots of questions from the compliance perspective. We're going to have to uh, uh, kind of slice and dice this one when the documents come out and see what exactly the monitor's role is and how they're going to accomplish this. Uh, the criminal plea uh, enforcement action that is in federal district court in Dallas has a monitor. Uh, where that monitor was in this process is completely unknown. Um, it's not clear why the Department of Commerce raised the non-compliance with the Deferred Prosecution Agreement and not the U.S. Corporate Monitor. Um, that that question has never been answered. It's also unclear how the monitor working uh, for the Department of Justice, as specified by Wilbur Ross, will uh, coexist uh, equally or unequally with, with the court appointed monitor for the criminal sanction. All of those questions are up in the air, and I think we're going to be following this one for quite some time, Jay. Yeah, and just uh, a couple more things to point out. If you recall, this is the case when uh, the judge who was in charge of this uh, decided to appoint a former student of his to be the monitor, and there was a bit of a, an outcry there. So that's uh, point number one. And number two, there's this whole, I guess, national security issue, plus the fact that um, ZTE was in a direct violation of what they were supposed to do. They were selling to both, uh, I guess, Iran and then North Korea. So they were selling um, sensitive telecommunications equipment to them. So while we've got uh, the White House slapping tariffs on our allies uh, un under the guise of the fact that it's, um, you know, a military issue, we really have somebody here who has kind of skated the law to try to help our enemies. And we, what's our response? We're, uh, we're getting them back into business. So uh, as Alice said to the rabbit, curiouser and curiouser. Uh, uh, that's Miss former Mr. Screenwriter with his alliteration, alliteration, alliteration. So Jay, we so had I a really interesting yeah. article by our colleague, Mike Volkoff. And I found it interesting for uh, several different reasons. He, he really had a couple of different things going on in the um, article. But what struck me about it, Jay, was um, he brought up the issue uh, that corporate compliance programs have become much more prominent, uh, much more well-recognized in companies. And uh, it's not so much with great power comes great responsibility, but if you're going to be elevated up to the C-suite and or have a board position, um, 
there's going to be some expectations on you. And those expectations may go counter to what the reality is. And he brought it up in terms of our compliance departments heading down the road for a reckoning because, <coughs> excuse me, if uh, there's a compliance failure, are corporate management going to blame the compliance officers or um, are they going to take a look at, do a true cause analysis and find out whether or not uh, there's a systemic failure or even a breakdown or override of internal controls. So uh, this piece is entitled when corporate failures, excuse me, when corporate leaders fail to listen. So it really gets some great and direct advice, I think, for the compliance practitioner to engage in. One is you have to educate your senior leadership. Two is you have to have uh, robust controls. But three, under no circumstances can you aver, state, avow, affirm, attest that there will never be another compliance failure because um, compliance failures come about because of human beings. And as long as human beings are involved, uh, you're going to have the potential for a compliance failure. So a lot to think about. I commend the uh, article to everyone. And um, we just earlier this morning uh, finished recording a, a session of everything compliance. So Mike kind of addresses some of those issues. So be on the lookout for that in a week and a half's time or so. Uh, we have some good news to report. Our colleague, Lisa Azofsky, uh, who uh, is now uh, been appointed the new head of the SFO. Uh, she is uh, a dual UK and US citizen, graduated from Harvard Law, clerk for a federal judge, and was a former US attorney. Um, she comes to the SFO from having worked from Exeger, which is a company that uh, does forensics, investigations, monitoring. So uh, one of the hopes is that she can bring her uh, technological know-how to bear on the SFO. Um, we have a couple different um, folks speaking about this that we've linked to in the show notes. As always, uh, <clears throat> Dick Casson and the FCA blog was uh, on top of this. Uh, Mara Limo Stein writes about it in the Wall Street Journal and we also have our colleagues checking in from the UK, Barry V2 and Richard Kolev. How do I say Richard's last name, Tom? It's uh, Kovaleski QC. Thank you. So um, what they seem to say is, while there are increasing parallels between the US and UK systems, there remain important practical differences between the way authorities across the pond – meaning us, approach the transatlantic investigation of suspected corporate crime. The appointment of a former U.S. prosecutor with years of experience working in the private sector represents an opportunity for further harmonization of the U.K. and the U.S. approach. And they say Ms. Zosofsky's appointment is welcome. So that's um, <clears throat> a very positive view from the U.K. bribery guys. There is a slightly uh, less sanguine view here when they're talking about at one point during the past year, um, Theresa May wanted to um, roll the SFO up into another department in the UK. And at one point, um, I believe Lisa came out in uh, support of that. So um, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, it's great that they finally found a successor to David Green. Uh, she's a wonderful attorney. Uh, she's very bright, and we wish her the best. And hopefully this ushers in uh, a new era of cooperation between the UK as uh, SFO and the DOJ and in our investigative uh, global efforts. So we also had a really interesting article about, uh, of all companies, Netflix. And certainly I'm, I'm a huge Netflix fan. Uh, I don't know what uh, what it does for the Rosen household, but I suspect with uh, given Rosen and his uh, triumvirate of girls, there's lots of Netflix going on either live or with DVDs. But they've got a quite an interesting um, disruption around corporate governance. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, um, they're really s strange as a company, but they believe in transparency and they actually like – give each board member member a 30 uh, page memo before each uh, board meeting so they can actually 
get familiar with the uh, agenda and they can be informed and they can ask questions. And uh, sometimes boards uh, are often serving as a, a rubber stamp for the management, but it seems that this situation has been going on for the past several years. And, uh, you know, most boards only meet four to eight times a year. They meet almost on a monthly basis. And um, some of the things that allows them to do is just to be uh, more strategic and uh, more reactive to forces that are happening in the marketplace. And uh, this is from research that was done from Stanford University. And um, basically, they interviewed seven out of nine of the CEO, or rather, seven out of nine outside directors. And uh, to encourage openness, the directors were assured that their names would not be published. And the feedback about the government structure was positive across all interviews. So uh, it's, it's very nice to have uh, a positive story about not only corporate governance, but a, a company taking their board as uh, a serious uh, tool that they can have, an ally to help them set strategy. And, you know, we're, of course, extrapolating this into the ethics and compliance realm. But uh, this was definitely um, a refreshing story to read during the week of uh, all these NPAs and DPAs. Your thoughts on it, Tom? So uh, I just uh, was uh, really impressed <clears throat> that a company as public as Netflix would uh, uh, go through this and put this information out there. And, and I'm hopeful that other companies will take note uh, from the business perspective, I think Netflix has uh, done obviously extraordinarily well uh, over the past 15 years or whatever it's been of their existence. They continue to innovate. They continue to bring great quality. And uh, I don't know if this uh, burdens you or makes your heart heavy as a, uh, I, I guess, recovering screenwriter, but uh, some of the television uh, uh, new content they've c come out with, I think, is far superior than what we're seeing in the movies now. So, uh, I would just say kudos. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the pendulum has definitely shifted over the last decade or so. And if you're an auteur and you have something you want to say and you want to get it out immediately, uh, places like Netflix and Amazon have the financial wherewithal that they can green light not only a pilot, but they'll say, give us 10 episodes. So you could, you know, there's... Um, I see billboards all over L.A. for a new series that's coming out. I think it's on Epics, and it's called Deep State. Now, I don't know where anybody would get an idea like that, but yeah. there is great creative talent <clears throat> working in the TV. Uh, Mrs. Monitors and I, I enjoy Mozart in the Jungle on Netflix, and uh, there's just a, lo a lot of good stuff out there stuff for uh, the girls as well. But uh, kudos to Netflix. Uh, now we are at the part of the podcast when uh, you tell us uh, what kind of visits you've got going on and are we still number one? So uh, we are no longer number one in new releases. Uh, uh, somewhat sad to report, but uh, we're not new anymore, right? So how can we not new anymore? So we're not actually in new releases. So that's why we're no longer number one. But uh, the sales are still strong. It's going great. Uh, lots of great positive feedback. People have uh, greatly enjoyed the book. Um, a couple of pointed out it's really the only book that's incorporates both the evaluation of corporate compliance programs uh, from February 2017 together with the new FCPA corporate enforcement policy. So I was able to hit the curve uh, curve on that. Um, I've got a book signing coming up in Houston on uh, June 28th uh, from 5.30 to 7. I'm going to be in Boston uh, the week of uh, – or on the 25th uh, and hopefully have some events to announce uh, next week there. But certainly on June 26th, I will be at the um, – Compliance Week Technology Conference, and I'll have some books uh, available there if somebody wants to drop by. I've also, Jay, got a master class training coming up uh, for those who may be in Houston and want to get the top um, training from the guy who wrote the book on compliance on June 21 and 22 at the Law Offices of Ware Snow in Houston. I've got the link to the registration uh, on that. Uh, Jay, as you well know, I had a uh, just a I had a great time, and we put together a great five-part podcast series on 
suspension and debarment with your uh, AMI colleague, Rod Grandin. Uh, the, uh, I have to tell you that I was a little surprised that nearly 2,000 people would download this uh, podcast series, but that's the numbers we got. So lots of interest out there on suspension and debarment. And, and just a couple of things beyond the, the technical expertise of Rod, and obviously he's been doing this for quite a while inside the government and out. So he was able to, to really explain it in a straightforward manner that I think everyone would understand. But he tied suspension and debarment, the technical remedy, to the FCPA and the greater compliance community in ways I had not thought about. And I've got two separate episodes, one in episode three or part three, where he talked about the convergence of suspension and debarment and the FCPA. And then today's episode, part five, remedies and compliance, where he gave the compliance practitioner uh, quite a bit to think about. So uh, I greatly learned a lot. I think anybody who listens to it would learn a lot. Uh, Once again, uh, uh, Kudos and thanks to to, uh, Affiliated Monitors for sponsoring that series, but really putting out a lot of solid information to some people in, uh, I would say my people, the anti-corruption compliance community, who may not have been aware of really the technical aspects of suspension and debarment from the U.S. government perspective and how it really applies across a much broader broader spectrum of compliance. And it's... uh Thank you for those kind words, Tom, towards AMI. Uh, I think it almost really informs what we discussed earlier with ZTE, and we should uh, definitely keep those concepts in mind as we see how that situation plays out. So uh, you want to take us home? Sure. Uh, On behalf of Tom Fox, the compliance evangelist, and myself, Jay Rose, and Mr. Monitor, We'd like to thank you for joining us for this week in the FCPA, episode 106, for the week ending June 8th, the back in the FCPA saddle again. Um, Lots happening, and uh, this will, I hope, augur an exciting summer of uh, baseball, new movies, going to see uh, Ocean's 8 with the family tonight, and uh, thank you so much for spending some of your weekend with us, and have a great day. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help on our rankings and help get the word out about the only weekly wrap-up in compliance and ethics. Also, if you have any questions, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. You can email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you'll join us again next week where we review next week's top compliance and ethics stories. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.